Welcome to the Southern IPM Hour. This one's going to be really interesting. I was telling Al Adam that I was very glad that our paths finally crossed where we could actually see each other in person. Um, I can't wait to hear about his project, which is increasing lawn diversity to promote biodiversity and reduce management inputs in urban landscapes. Um, and that's going to be coming up shortly. Just a couple things. This is presented by the Southern IPM Center, which presents research issues and programs in integrated pest management from the Southern region through this webinar series. I'm Kayla Watson. I'm the communication director for the Southern IPM Center, and we are hosted at NC State and UGA with a mission to coordinate IPM across the region. We're also one of four regional IPM centers supported by the USDA NIFA Crop Protection and Pest Management Regional Coordination Program. Um, just a couple of announcements from the Southern IPM Center. I don't know if you've heard about this. I hope you have, but just in case you haven't, there is a new national grant for DEIA. The four regional IPM centers are actively promoting diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility efforts through three different funding opportunities. Um, the primary objective of the Regional IPM Center's DEIA grant program is to establish diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility as integral aspects of the IPM community. So I'm going to put a link uh, where you can find out more information and apply for that funding in the chat. And also, just so you are aware, the um, it's just something separate here, the RFA for the CP. PM program for both the EIP and ARDP project proposals, um, that is out now. So if you want to do um, an amazing project like Adam Dale's and you want to put in a proposal for an ARDP project, those are due on February 15th. So you can get through the holidays first. Don't worry about that. But I did want to let you know that that deadline is approaching and I'll put the, um, the link for that in the chat as well. And Emmanuel is also in here, who is the leader of that program. So you could probably find out more information from him if you'd like. Um, so th those are just two programs I wanted to let you know, both the DI DEIA and the uh, CPPM RFA. Both of those are out. But as for the webinar today, um, this project is an ARDP or Applied Research and Development Project, a part of the Crop Protection and Pest Management Program area at USDA NIFA. This talk will be recorded and that link will be available after the webinar. If you have questions for the speaker as we go throughout the talk, we'll answer those questions at the end. So make sure you type those questions into the Q&A located on the bottom of your Zoom screen, which is a little bit different from the chat. It just helps us not lose those questions if, if people have those questions throughout. Uh, today's speaker is Adam Dale at the University of Florida. And Adam, thanks so much for doing this talk today. I'm so looking forward to this presentation. Thank you, Kayla. I appreciate the introduction. Um, and thanks everyone for joining us. Good afternoon. Um, I'm excited to give a recap of a lot of work that we've been doing in my lab uh, and my collaborators' labs over the past four to five years. Um, so I'm going to try to talk about four to five years of work in less than an hour, uh, but hopefully I won't cram too much in here and you'll get a good idea of some of the progress we've made in this system. Uh, so I am an associate professor at the University of Florida. Uh, my program primarily focuses on insect ecology and management and turf and ornamental systems, uh, primarily focused in urban landscapes, but any, any turf and ornamental systems kind of fall under our umbrella. Uh, and we really focus on how these systems can become more sustainable in our rapidly urbanizing landscapes. And I really like maps. So I like starting out with just illustrating the relevance of the work that we're doing. <clears throat> so this is a satellite image of the Fort Lauderdale, Florida area in 1984. Um, and just shows you kind of the extent uh, of the built environment in that region in 1984. Uh, but what I think is really kind of uh, impressive is how this landscape transitions over the next uh, few decades um, from 1984 all the way to 2020. And hopefully if you stared at that screen 
uh, and kind of blurred your eyes or even focus on some areas, I would, I would suggest focusing on the, the west side. Uh, you see this transition where a lot of these undeveloped lands have now become neighborhoods and urban landscapes. Uh, satellite imagery has also gotten much better, uh, but I think it's pretty impressive. And this is happening all over the place, particularly in Florida, but really throughout the United States. Um, so I think Florida is a prime example of the pace of urbanization and the magnitude of urbanization. So here's a little map of the state. The red areas indicate uh, developed landscapes, urban landscapes. Uh, and if you stare at this map, you'll see the projected land use change over the next 50 years or so to what will be developed by the year 2070. And that red area did not shrink. It only became more expansive. And so you can see that this, this is, a, is a major trend and a major land use change over the next few decades. Uh, one of the drivers of this in the state of Florida is that we have over a thousand people moving into the state to become residents every day. And those people need places to live. Uh, so that coinciding with that uh, is gonna be about 7 million acres converted to urban land use by the year 2060. So as I'm sure is no surprise, if you were to plop yourself down into any of those landscapes, kind of the stereotypical uh, setup is gonna be what you see in this picture. You're gonna see grassy ground cover, you're gonna see ornamental beds, you're gonna see some trees and shrubs. Uh, and this is very much the landscape of the built environment. And in many cases, unless you really know your plants, you could drop down <clears throat> into any situation, any neighborhood, anywhere in the Southeast, and you would probably have a hard time knowing which state you were in because this is such a ubiquitous uh, landscape type. Uh, focusing on the ground, uh, turf grass is the default component of ground cover in the built environment um, and is estimated to be 40 to 50 percent of total land use in urban spaces. Um, there's a lot of work that has tried to quantify the magnitude of, of turf grass ground cover in the country, uh, but from an economic perspective, it's, it ranks third in economic impact behind corn and soybeans, which I think would surprise a lot of people. People see turf grass everywhere. Everybody knows what a lawn is, uh, but a lot of people don't really connect the dots between that magnitude and the economic impact of this industry. Zooming in a little further on ground covers in the United States, we can focus on the turf grass industry in Florida, which is where I'm based, uh, because turf, the Florida turf grass industry has the largest turf industry in the country, <clears throat> with well over four and a half million acres of turf grass in the state. Um, and this is only becoming a larger industry with more and more land to plant turf grass on. Since, as I showed you, we are rapidly urbanizing and the plants that go around these uh, built environments are largely turf grass. Um, I'll get into this a little more detail later, but generally speaking, there are about five genera of turf grass species uh, used in Florida and throughout much of the southern half of the United States, uh, and a few species within each of those in some cases, but we'll get into more detail on that. As an entomologist, of course, I am focused on the insects in this system, uh, and most importantly, because turf grasses are under frequent pest pressure. Um, so turf grass throughout the southern United States uh, and particularly in Florida, is under heavy pest pressure at all times from pathogens, um, but also insects. And so in these cases, we're, we've, we've got uh, pretty heavy pesticide use. And when pests are not prevented, we have damaged turf grass that provides much less value than healthy turf grass. 
So when you have a lawn that looks like this one here on the right, that's had a severe uh, chinch bug outbreak, we know that this lawn is not providing the benefits that that lawn was put there and intended to provide. Things like water filtration, temperature mitigation, carbon sequestration, and aesthetic value, among other things. It's also expensive. Um, the maintenance and uh, replacement of lawns cost a lot of money. To give you an idea of really what this constant pest pressure translates to, uh, these are two calendar-based pesticide application schedules that are real schedules that I got from pest control companies in the state of Florida. Uh, and so in Northern Florida, kind of where I am in Gainesville, uh, the standard calendar-based program includes an insecticide application every other month. If you go to South Florida, where we have more of a tropical climate and year-round growing season, where these insects never go dormant, uh, in many cases, people are putting insecticide applications on those lawns every month. And so as you can imagine, that leads to a few problems. Uh, insecticide resistance being one main one, but also a lot of unintended consequences and an intensively managed turf grass system. To give you a little more insight into the kind of the life, kind of what I consider the life cycle of turf grass in the South, um, it all starts, almost all starts as sod. So warm season turf grasses are predominantly vegetatively produced. Um, so you get sod production and harvest. All of this sod is grown and um, planted as cultivar monocultures of a single species. So one genotype that has been selectively developed for its advanced traits um, of a single species. That sod's harvested, planted in a new or renovated landscape. That turf is established and maintained for an undetermined amount of time. If that maintenance uh, translates to pest outbreaks or environmental stress or other damage, this is what you wind up with. Um, in some cases, if you're in my yard, that's what you wind up with. Uh, and then you go back to needing new sod or some other alternative. <clears throat> and so because of this intensive maintenance system uh, and because of the way that sod is grown and planted and maintained as a monoculture of a single genotype, uh, we run into some, some limitations. Um, and really we're getting at this bigger issue of biodiversity loss. There's mounting evidence, well-supported evidence, that biodiversity is declining around the globe due to all sorts of different factors. Uh, but many of those factors are linked to urbanization and the way we uh, create and maintain plant communities in any kind of anthropogenic system. Uh, so the two primary drivers of habitat loss are I mean, of biodiversity loss are habitat loss and pesticide exposure. And although the, the bulk of pesticide exposure on the, the global scale is from agricultural inputs and use, uh, it's still a very relevant and important aspect of turf grass systems and maintained urban landscapes. And so because of this, uh, lawns are a prime target and opportunity for biodiversity conservation. So a prime opportunity because they are the pervasive, the ubiquitous ground cover of the most rapidly expanding land use type in the country, uh, but also a prime target because in many cases they're intensively managed, they rely on pesticides, and they have very simplified plant communities, which support simplified uh, biodiversity. And so there's all sorts of great initiatives going on around the country. I'm sure some of you have heard of No Mo May, um, Bee Lawns. There's all sorts of projects. Several several projects uh, have also been funded by the USDA to, to dive into this and look at um, pollinator-friendly alternatives to turf grass. Um, 
And so when you when you think about turfgrass systems and increasing the ecological value of these systems, I would say there's a spectrum of solutions that are needed. <clears throat> um, and so we want to increase biodiversity. One way to do that is increasing plant diversity. Uh, another way to do that is to reduce pesticide inputs and the intensity of pesticide use. And so you've kind of got this spectrum. So my colleague Kyle Wickings up at Cornell made this great image that I use all the time because I think it does a really good job of illustrating this point. Uh, so on the right here, we have our intensively managed turf grass monocultures. And as we work our way to the left, we go to this completely different system where we have kind of a meadow wildflower habitat. And so you have this kind of dichotomy of you've got a lot of people who are pushing for the far left, you've got a lot of people who are pushing for the far right, um, but really there's a gradient here. Um, and I think solutions exist within each of those across the whole gradient. Um, here on the far left, where we have uh, a lot more plant diversity, a lot more structural complexity, I would call this an emerging market and in industry. And here on the right, in Florida alone, we have a, an existing, very well established $14 billion industry. Um, so I think we have two very different systems. And I would argue this one here on the right is more of the low hanging fruit that we can have uh, more rapid impact with. <clears throat> and so my, my lab uh, at the University of Florida is, is kind of addressing multiple aspects of that gradient um, where we're looking at what happens when you intentionally mix and install turf alternatives. Uh, we're looking at what happens when you plant a turf grass lawn and it just naturally becomes colonized by various non-turf plants and then you just mow that and we're looking at what happens when you mix turf grasses together and so the, that last point is what i'm going to focus on uh, for the rest of this uh, discussion so Thinking about genotypes. So I mentioned that warm season turf grasses are produced and planted as intraspecific cultivar monocultures. So single cultivars of one genotype of one species. And there are many different cultivars of any given turf grass species. And each of those varies in their uh, ability to tolerate different pests and environmental conditions. Some are good in the shade, some are good in full sun, some are more drought tolerant, some are more cold tolerant, and so on. Um, we also have a spectrum of pest susceptibility, whether that's diseases, nematodes, or insects. Uh, more recently in Florida, we have a virus that is lethal to one genotype of St. Augustine grass, uh, but is not lethal to the other cultivars that are commercially available. So just slight genetic variability can translate to a lot of different outcomes. When we're thinking about insect herbivores and potential plant pests, we also know that uh, genotypes of a plant species vary in their nutrient content, they vary in their chemistry, their chemical defenses, um, and these traits can really affect the behavior and development of herbivores feeding on those cultivars. Um, so we see examples with uh, invasive species like Japanese beetles. They eat less when they are exposed to different hosts um, rather than all the same host. Uh, the clouded sulfur butterfly also develops more slowly and into smaller individuals when it's forced to switch hosts from one to the other, rather than feeding on all the same hosts throughout its development. There's other works, a really good uh, body of work showing that cultivar diversity in agricultural systems can be a good way to leverage the benefits of plant diversity uh, without compromising plant productivity or production practices that growers rely on. Um, 
and basically leveraging associational resistance um, while maintaining the same standards that you already rely on. Uh, so John Tooker uh, has done work in wheat, looking at cultivar mixtures of wheat and how they affect pest infestations, um, and has demonstrated that when you mix cultivars of wheat compared to monocultures of wheat, outcomes for aphid pests vary. So aphids in uh, mixed cultivar plantings were less fecund and smaller, uh, less fit than aphids and wheat monocultures. And so when we started working on this project, the thought was even, and still the thought is, even the, even the most advanced turf grass cultivars are still susceptible to some pest or some environmental stress. There is no cultivar that is uh, invincible. Um, so all cultivars have pros and cons. So rather than producing and planting a monoculture of any given cultivar, what if we mixed cultivars, these advanced superior genetic lines, what if we used those in combination to reap the benefits of all of them and create a more resilient turf grass stand? And so this is where our CPPM ARDP funding came in um, and where my colleagues really came in and started helping me work on this question. So Brian Unruh and Marco Schiavon in the Department of Environmental Horticulture here at the University of Florida, Basil Iannone in the School of Forest Fisheries and Geomatic Sciences here at UF, and Susanna Mia Lewis in the Crop and Soil Sciences Department at NC State. Um, this is the team that, that we pulled together to address the question that I just presented. <clears throat> so if we look at warm season turf grasses, uh, warm season turf grasses are generally used from the southernmost part of the United States throughout the green trans transition zone area. Not all can do well throughout the transition zone, but some do. Uh, if you look at the top five most common uh, warm season turf grasses, we have St. Augustine grass, zoysia, bahia, bermuda, and centipede grass. And in almost every case, other than a few exceptions with uh, centipede and bahia, uh, these plant materials are vegetatively propagated, produced, and planted um, as cultivar monocultures. In Florida, over half of sod production is St. Augustine grass. And St. Augustine grass is estimated to occupy over 75% of residential lawns in the state. So this is by far the dominant turf grass species um, out there throughout the largest turf industry in the country. Um, and any given year, there are five to seven cultivars of St. Augustine grass available for purchase and installation. Uh, within those cultivars, this is a, a pie chart of the composition of cultivars of St. Augustine grass in Florida in about 2007, I believe. And at that time, 81% of St. Augustine grass production in the state was a single cultivar, um, which I think is pretty dramatic. Uh, that shifted a little and declined a little as more have become available, but that was the case at that time. So really low, low diversity of plant material out there. And these, these plants are plagued by a variety of insects, uh, really the same culprits in most cases where we have some mealybug pests, army worms, web worms, mole crickets, chinch bugs. Uh, and I'm going to focus on a couple of these for the next little bit. So I'm going to spend a good bit of time on this slide because uh, this slide really introduces the experimental approach that we use throughout uh, all of our experiments uh, focused on this question. <clears throat> so we're working with St. Augustine grass, one species of turf grass, and we are working with six of the most uh, readily available 
cultivars of St. Augustine grass. So I've listed those six cultivars here on the left. And throughout all of our experiments, we are comparing three different treatments of cultivar diversity. So we have monocultures, your, your conventional standard turf grass approach, so single cultivar plantings. We have mixtures of two cultivars, so two blends of any two cultivars together. And then we have mixtures of four cultivars, so four of the six cultivars blended together. Um, and because of the, the way the math works out, uh, with a pool of six cultivars, if you're going to make blends of two and blends of four, there are 15 unique combinations of each of those. So no, to, no cultivar combination is repeated. So we have 15 unique combinations. All right, so we're comparing monocultures, mixtures of two, and mixtures of four throughout the rest of this presentation. So the first thing we started looking at was, uh, are there bottom-up effects of cultivar blends on fall armyworm? So fall armyworm is a, a recurring insect pest of turf grasses throughout the United States. Um, and it's a good model system, and it's an easy to work with lepidopteran pest uh, for use in experimental studies. Um, so my student, Ethan, uh, really led the way on this work, and he started asking questions about how cultivar blends may affect fall armyworm fitness. And so he specifically looked at uh, effects of, on body size, survival, abundance, and herbivory in St. Augustine grass. And what he found was that there was indeed uh, associational resistance effects on fall armyworms when you compare cultivar blends to cultivar monocultures. Um, so when presented with those options, the, our three treatments, um, fall armyworms developed into smaller individuals when they fed on a blend compared to a monoculture. They preferentially colonized monocultures over blends of two or four, and they fed less in blends of two or four compared to cultivar monocultures. So this was kind of our first evidence uh, that there may be something going on here, and there may be some value uh, linked to cultivar blends from an IPM perspective. And so he wanted to dive a little deeper into that and say, okay, uh, we see some benefits, but it's kind of messy. Um, the way we did the experiments could have influenced our results and the composition of these blends. Since we have 15 unique blends, the composition of those blends may have also influenced our results. So he wanted to know if there were cultivar dependent effects uh, in these effects that we were seeing, and uh, if these effects were driven by pre- or post-consumptive interactions with the fall armyworm. So we know that in some studies there are demonstrable effects of diet mixing when you force feed an insect different diets, um, but we also know that when you put an insect in nature and have it interact with these living plants, you see different effects. Um, so he wanted to ask questions along those lines. And so in this in this uh, in this study, we're only looking at our cultivar blends um, because we're trying to see if there are effects of cultivar composition and experimental methods. Um, so we're only comparing blends of two and blends of four together. Uh, and so we did two two experiments. We did a, a forced diet mixing treatment. So these caterpillars were in these trays and they were force fed. They were provided only uh, a rotation of cultivars. Um, and then we had a limited choice assay where we planted these plants in pots, put the caterpillars in those pots. And then in both cases, we recorded larval weight, development rate, survival, and herbivory. <clears throat> so uh, we, we found several different things, and I'll walk you through this. Um, 
Ultimately, we found that the cultivar present in a blend and the number of cultivars present in a blend mattered from in terms of effects on fall armyworm. So the first thing we see is that uh, blends of four had a more pronounced effect than blends of two. So blends of four developed into 15% smaller individuals. They developed more slowly and they fed less than uh, caterpillars that developed in blends of two. Uh, however, most of our effects depended on the presence of specific cultivars. So for example, if that blend had bitter blue in it, then caterpillars tended to be smaller. If that blend had bitter blue in it, they also survived less. Um, but if they had classic in it, they developed more slowly. And if they had Florotam or Palmetto, they fed less. So we see these cultivar dependent effects. Um, and I say up here that, it's, that the effect of higher cultivar diversity may be a sampling effect uh, because um, if you're a blend of four, you're more likely to contain one of these cultivars that has a more pronounced negative effect. Um, we also found that cultivar blends affected fall armyworm only when fall armyworms interacted with those plants in pots. When we force-fed fall armyworms these mixed cultivar diets, there was no effect of cultivar diversity on those caterpillars. So in summary, I think we have pretty clear demonstration that there are negative effects of St. Augustine grass cultivar blends on fall armyworms compared to single cultivar plantings. And given a finite cultivar pool, where we only have six cultivars to pull from, mixing as many cultivars as possible has value because you're more likely to get one of those cultivars in that mixture that matters. And ultimately this may, may translate to reduced armyworm colonization, population growth rates, and herbivory in St. Augustine grass stands. So that's a chewing pest, a, a big chewing pest fall armyworm, but what about effects on these key sap feeding pests like chinch bugs? Uh, so the southern chinch bug is a major pest of turf grasses in the south, particularly St. Augustine grass. And this is work that was led by my student James, um, who kind of picked up where Ethan left off and kept things rolling. So the southern chinch bug is the most economically important southern turf grass pest because it is uh, pretty much persistent in Florida throughout the year, develops very quickly and outbreaks very quickly, which rapidly kills lawns. Uh, so this is a, an example of what a chinch bug outbreak will do to a St. Augustine grass lawn. Um, this was actually in my backyard after I moved to Florida and got excited about having a chinch bug infestation and quickly learning why people care about it so much. Uh, because of this really intensive pest pressure and the calendar-based pesticide programs that I showed you earlier, there are multiple documented instances of insecticide resistance to pyrethroids, neonics, carbamates, and organophosphates with southern chinch bugs in the state of Florida. So we wanted to ask similar questions to what I just showed you with the fall armyworms. Uh, and <clears throat> in this case, we use potted plantings and we are only comparing the most diverse mixtures, so mixtures of four to monoculture plantings. So our monoculture plantings are only one cultivar, uh, and that cultivar was Floritam, uh, because it is by far the most prevalent uh, cultivar used in the state. And then our mixed uh, mixture of fours contained the same 15 unique combinations like I referenced earlier. And so there were uh, within each planting, there were four stolons that were crossed as depicted in this figure and in this photo, and those were planted like that and then allowed to grow in and establish. 
And so this picture on the far left is what those established pots look like. Um, and so what James did is he infested each of these pots. Once those pots were fully established, he infested each one with 20 chinch bugs uh, and let them do their thing for 12 weeks, um, during which he was taking weekly measurements of turf quality, turf density. Um, and at the end of that 12 week period, he took each pot, dunked it in a bucket, of, a five gallon bucket of water and collected all the chinch bugs that floated to the top. Um, we have found that that's the most effective way to destructively sample a turf grass planting for chinch bugs. And so what did he find? So we were actually really surprised with what he found because he found that chinch bugs were more abundant in the cultivar blends of four compared to the cultivar monocultures of Floritan. Um, and this was a pretty clear difference, pretty clear trend. And opposite of what we found with the fall army worm infestations. <clears throat> However, a caveat to that, so I should have hidden this figure first, but um, so what we're seeing here on the x-axis is chinch bug density uh, per pot, and, and what we're seeing on the vertical axis is the percentage of that pot that is uh, green turf grass covered. Um, and each color line is one of our different treatments. So the red line is our cultivar blends of four. The blue line are our cultivar monocultures. Um, and so what we see is that as chinch bug density increases in a pot, percent green cover declines as you would expect. But throughout that, uh, throughout the, the plot, <clears throat> the four cultivar blends maintain a higher percent green cover no matter no, no matter what the chinch bug density is. Um, and so what this suggests is that those blended plantings are able to maintain greater coverage regardless of chinch bug infestation. Um, so I would say there's less evident value for managing southern chinch bugs with cultivar blends, but cultivar blends may provide greater wiggle room or room for tolerance of chinch bug infestations rather than the current zero tolerance uh, mindset. Um, and really zero, zero, there is zero tolerance because as soon as you get a population that's able to start reproducing, that turf is gonna decline really rapidly. So maybe blends will provide a greater uh, uh, area for error and tolerance before treatments have to be applied. So these are those were lab studies, greenhouse studies. Um, now I want to take things to the field where re, in more real world uh, conditions. And so this is going to this shows you our experimental approach in the field. And so we had four geographic locations that we did these experiments, replicated each experiment at each of these locations. So we had a location in Jackson Springs, North Carolina, uh, Jay, Florida, uh, just south of Gainesville, Florida, and in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. So we span about six degrees of latitude, I think, and multiple USDA hardiness zone uh, areas. And at each location, we created these uh, randomized complete plot field plots where we have plots that contain monocultures, plots that contain blends of two cultivars, and plots that contain blends of four cultivars. Um, so here's a plot map on the far right. For example, this top left box is a blend of four, then you go down to a blend of two, then you have a monoculture, and each color represents different blocks. Um, and as you might imagine, this was a ton of work. Uh, at four geographic locations, planting 63 plots, uh, and each plot is composed of plugs that had to be randomized within each plot. Um, so in this figure in the top left, each color stake represents a different cultivar. Um, and so 
in this plot, we have a mixture of four cultivars and each cultivar is randomized for every set of four. So this was a pretty detail oriented and labor intensive process, but we did it and we did it at all four locations um, after a lot of hot hard work. So our first question that James was interested in asking is, does increasing turf grass genotypic diversity influence natural enemies by providing harborage or resources? So can you blend cultivars together and subsequently boost the abundance or diversity of things like spiders, beetles, uh, ants, predatory bugs, and so on? And so to get at this question, he did a bunch of surveys using pitfall traps um, to quantify the activity density of these organisms at each of these locations within uh, each of our cultivar diversity treatments. And unfortunately, he found no effect of cultivar diversity. So regardless of how many cultivars were planted in those plots, uh, the activity density of predatory arthropods did not differ between cultivars, cultivar monocultures, blends of two or blends of four, no matter the time of year, no matter the location. And we see a very similar effect uh, on natural enemy richness. So the number of <clears throat> uh, taxa, different taxa in those plots. So there's also apparent limited value for natural enemy conservation by mixing cultivars. Um, so I would argue with cultivar blends of turf grass, the primary avenue for increasing biodiversity is via reduced pesticide inputs uh, rather than providing habitat and resources for more things. So we likely need to leverage those bottom-up effects of cultivar blends on key pests. So no matter how much I care about insects, and no matter how much I could demonstrate effects of uh, any IPM approach on an insect pest, uh, ultimately the plants matter the most and the plant outcomes matter the most for growers and for consumers. And in the turf grass world, aesthetics and agronomic performance drives everything. So we switched gears a little bit and started asking how mixing cultivars of St. Augustine grass might affect the agronomic quality and aesthetic quality and marketability of this plant material. Um, and this is a project that my uh, former student Brianna really started to tackle and working in these field plots. Um, and what she did is she did, she took three approaches. So first she, she took high resolution images using this light box. Um, so up close, photos within our plots to quantify different turf grass traits like density, color, uniformity, and so on. Uh, she also took aerial images like uh, these in the middle of our plots over time. And then we also did some surveys with industry professionals to learn about what they thought about these different plantings. Um, so this gives you an idea of what these plantings looked like within the light box images. Uh, so we have single cultivar, two cultivar, and four cultivar blends. Um, and so she was curious in how, how do these things compare in terms of agronomic and aesthetic metrics. And this gives you an idea of the aerial images over several years, um, how they change over time. And as you can see, 47 months after planting, you have some plots that have done uh, pretty poorly uh, compared to their 11 month starting point. So here on the ver uh, on the X axis, we have year after planting from year one to year four. On the vertical axis, we have the percentage of a plot occupied by green turf grass cover. And then our different line markings are gonna be our three different treatments from monoculture, mix of two and mix of four. And what we see is that the plots perform about equally in year one and year two, but starting in year three, we start to see a decline in our monoculture plantings 
which continues and gets more dramatic in year three or year four. <clears throat> but our mixtures of two and four are no different from one another, and they maintain higher green cover over this time period. If you zoom in a little on what this difference looks like, um, we have a couple of examples here. So having more cultivars present in a turf grass stand appears to increase resilience to pests and stress. So if one cultivar declines, the others can compensate um, and maintain a covered stand. So uh, here on the right, we have cultivar A planted in monoculture in this middle plot. Cultivar A planted with one other cultivar at the bottom plot and cultivar A planted with three others in the top right plot. And then the same comparisons here in this left image. And hopefully you can see that when that cultivar A is by itself, it is doing much worse than if it is mixed with other cultivars. Um, so Brianna was also interested in uh, seeing what industry professionals thought about this. So she, during our turf grass field days, uh, she engaged these industry professionals with these plots and asked them to walk through the plots and rate them on a scale of one to nine, where a six is a minimally acceptable lawn, nine is perfect, one is awful, uh, and then turn in their answers, all anonymous, and see what, we, what they thought. So uh, we did this one year after planting, which is here on the left, and we did this three years after planting, which is here on the right. <clears throat> and we have each of our treatments on the x-axis and the visual quality rating on the vertical axis. And the red dotted line is our threshold of minimally acceptable. And ultimately what we find is that mixing cultivars extends the longevity of perceived acceptable perceived turf grass quality and reduces variability in quality. Um, so here, three years after planting, our four cultivar blend plots are the only ones that average above the minimally acceptable level, and there's a lot less variability in those ratings. So that's all great. Seems really encouraging, but one thing that we don't know is how these things persist over time. So Presumably, you plant a cultivar blend of four, and several years later, that blend of four is going to be a blend of two, or it may be a blend of, or it may be a monoculture. Um, maybe it's a blend of four, but it's going to change over time due to various selection pressures. Um, and so, how does that play out within these plantings? But also, how does geographic location influence those changes in cultivar composition? So we used our field plots in North Carolina, in North Florida, and in South Florida to answer those questions. So our objective was to determine how within plot cultivar composition changes over a three year period and if that depends on the location and composition of those plantings. And this is work that Susanna Mia Lewis at NC State and her team have really led the charge with because she has that skill set and I do not. Um, so what we did is that one year after planting and three years after planting, uh, we surveyed plant tissue within each of these plots. So we took 10 samples indicated by these hash marks uh, within this bottom left image. We took 10 tissue samples per plot and then uh, identified each of those samples at the molecular level to identify the cultivar uh, that each of those samples were. So you can't phenotypically identify these plant materials unless they have a basis. So we had to identify them using genetic markers. So we had a few hypotheses. Uh, one, St. Augustine grass cultivar blends will simplify over time. So there's no recruitment of new cultivars because this is all vegetative material. So the only option is to maintain the same level of uh, cultivar richness or, or simplify. Uh, our second hypothesis was that this rate of cultivar blend simplification would be most rapid at more southern latitudes where you have longer growing season, 
more intense selective pressures. And our third hypothesis was that um, cultivars within mixed plantings will become relatively less abundant within a given plot. So in other words, evenness, plots will become less even uh, as time goes on, and this will be the least even in more southern latitudes. So what did we find? So the, the next slide is going to have a couple figures that show uh, blends of two and blends of four. So here on the top, we have blends of two. On the bottom, we have blends of four. On the left, we have the change in cultivar richness. So we started with two cultivars, started with four cultivars, and each of these data points shows how many cultivars we lost over time. And then on the right, we have cultivar evenness per plot. So we know at the beginning, we had equal representation from each cultivar because each cultivar was planted in equal proportion throughout the plot. And over time, through our sampling efforts, uh, what, how did that uh, relative abundance of cultivars change? Um, so there's a lot to take in here, but a few brief uh, kind of high level summary points. Um, in short, we see that it took three years for any difference to show up in terms of cultivar richness or cultivar evenness. Um, we saw that cultivar richness declined uh, in all cases, well, it declined uh, in our most, uh, in our more southern latitudes. So here on the left side, three years after planting, <clears throat> in Fort Lauderdale, cultivar richness had gone uh, from two to one, whereas in North Carolina and in our northern Florida plots, they were significantly more rich. Um, and in our mixtures of four cultivars, as geographic location moved south, there was a greater loss in cultivar richness, as we predicted, where each location was statistically different in terms of how many cultivars we lost within that plot. Um, in terms of evenness, we only see a difference in evenness when we compare North Carolina to Florida. And Florida locations were less even than North Carolina plots. Um, so three years after planting, blends of four cultivars in North Carolina remained blends of three cultivars on average, whereas blends of four in Fort Lauderdale were predominantly cultivar monocultures after three years. And these crazy spaghetti charts show how that cultivar composition changed over time uh, in North Carolina here on the left and in Fort Lauderdale here on the right. Um, so in North Carolina, you can see that there is a change in the relative abundance of cultivars within a given plot over time, but there's a lot more overlap um, and a lot less dramatic of a difference between the relative abundance of cultivars per plot. Whereas in Fort Lauderdale, in our mixtures of four plots, you can see that this one cultivar, Seville, really became the dominant cultivar present within those plots over three years, um, even in the mixture of two plots. Um, so these are the, the behind the scenes cultivar changes that are driving those changes that we see in cultivar richness and cultivar evenness. So these in North Carolina are much more evenly distributed than these in Fort Lauderdale. So uh, cultivar blend persistence, um, cultivar composition matters, geographic location matters. Um, and I would argue that regions with greater selective pressures, probably as South Florida it seems to have, should start with a higher level of diversity at planting so that you can maintain some degree of diversity for longer. Um, but we have shown that, especially in North Carolina, it is possible to plant and sustain St. Augustine grass cultivar blends for at least three years after planting. 
in my opinion, uh, the future of warm season turf grass breeding and production should focus at least in part on uh, what we call multi-line cultivars. Um, and so multi-line cultivars are mixtures of genetic lines that are bred for phenotypic uniformity and agronomic traits. So where a breeder would uh, have a cultivar that was composed of multiple genotypes that they have selected for, for their compatibility and performance together. Um, and this would build resilience and long-term sustainability into warm season turf grass uh, production and management. Uh, so in summary, I think uh, turf grass cultivar blends of warm season turf grasses are a plausible IPM strategy. We found a lot of support for our hypotheses regarding insect pest performance, uh, resilience to pests and stress, um, and plant performance. Um, and I think we still have a lot of work to do to really get this, to move the needle and, and get this into industry use. But I think those are some of the next steps that we're going to pursue and try to get some on-farm studies, some collaborations with growers, um, because there has been a good bit of expressed interest in the industry uh, to look into this further. Um, and with that, I, I want to particularly thank my collaborators, Basil Iannone, Brian Unruh, Jason Cruz, Susanna Mia Lewis, Marco Schiavone, and Rocia Vanderlaat, and all of the students who played an essential role in doing this work um, and really leading the charge on these efforts. And with that, I'll be happy to take any questions if we have time for one or two. And thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Adam. So we did have a couple of questions that came through, but you answered them throughout your talk. So you had already answered their questions that they had. Um, one question that I have for you, Adam, is um, you're talking about the next steps that, that researchers should take with this um, data that you have from your project. Do you think you're going to pivot again with what you're looking for um, with this cultivar research or um, what kind of pivoting are you going to have to do you know projects that are this long usually that happens so I was just curious where you wanted to go next yeah for sure we've I've definitely my my ideas and perspectives on this approach have definitely evolved over the past four or five years um I think there's a lot of promise uh with this approach uh, I've spent a lot more time talking with the turf grass breeders and growers about the feasibility of it. And so I think there are a lot of logistic hurdles um, and production hurdles that would need to be overcome. We also run into IP issues where we have, if, if you're using existing cultivars, uh, if those cultivars are still patented, uh, they can't just be thrown into a field mixed with other cultivars. Right. Um, so we yeah. need to use all patent material or we need to start at the breeder stage with different genetic lines and kind of work from that initial research and development stage into sod production, which I think is the, is the, the most realistic and appropriate approach.